So amid a jangle of nerves, governors whose victories in the 2023 general election are being challenged in court are worried and slightly frightened as they wait to discover their fate. That's because the governorship tribunals are likely to deliver their judgments between now and the end of this month. Obviously, no one's quite sure how the tribunals might rule and whether elections will be annulled or upheld. So despite appearing to be calm, the parties and their candidates are an absolute jangle of jitters and nerves. But it's not just at the governorship level. Tribunals hearing petitions on the National Assembly elections have also been issuing their rulings. Recently, we saw the sacking of the PDP's Ikenga Ugochinere as a lawmaker in the House of Representatives. But just a few days ago, from the same PDP, we saw the success of the musician turned politician Olu Bankole Wellington, known popularly as Banky W, who, as one of the petitioners, managed to convince the tribunal to annul the Etiosa federal constituency election in Lagos State that pushed him into second place behind the Labour Party's Tadeus Atta. So for Banky W, a chance once again for a triumphant march towards victory. But can he make it happen? Well, we'll see, won't we? Tonight, I'm suitably delighted to say that the celebrated Nigerian singer, rapper, actor, entrepreneur, and politician, Olu Bankole Wellington, popularly known as Banky W, joins me now from our studios in Lagos. Thank you very much indeed for coming in, taking the time to talk to us, because I know your head must be bursting with sort of, you know, things you have to do in preparation for a new ballot and all the rest of it. So we appreciate the time that you've taken to come in. And you were, of course, one of the petitioners. Um, so this ruling gives you a second chance and another shot at the top prize. I know you've been reacting on social media to that judgment, but tell us once again how you feel about the tribunal's ruling and just summarize for us what the tribunal decided um, upon and the basis for its ruling, briefly. Good evening, Sir Charles. Thank you so much for having me on the program. It is an absolute pleasure and a privilege to be here. I, I appreciate it. Um, regarding the tribunal, we are, we are very um, grateful that the tribunal agreed that when it comes to matters of our elections and our political process, it's very important that every voice, um, that we acknowledge that every voice deserves to be heard and every vote deserves to be counted. And what we saw uh, in Etiosa, which I think probably reflected in some other areas of the country, was that you know, there were specific polling units in our general elections where the election just didn't happen. There were multiple polling units, um, uh, give or take about 40, where you know, there were various things. In some places, there was voter suppression and, and intimidation. In some places, there was violence. In other places, you know, INEC would show up, but they didn't have House of Reps ballots. In yet other places, INEC just wouldn't show up at all. And what we found was there were, you know, thousands upon thousands, from our calculations, about 29,000 or thereabout people who were prevented from participating in our elections. And this is their constitutional right. So right after the elections, actually hundreds of people queued up, um, came outside of the coalition center to protest. And you know, there was a palpable frustration. There were people who were crying. People were very, very um, upset that it felt like their constitutional rights were being taken away from them by not allowing them to part participate in these elections. And so for us, you know, we stand with those people because that's what being a representative is about, is about being the voice of the people. And regarding these elections, regardless of who people want to vote for, they should be allowed to participate. Now, it's unfortunate that that um, doesn't play up all the way to the presidency or to, you know, the senatorial level because there's not enough votes to sway those elections. But at least as far as the House of, Re House of Reps in Etiosa is concerned, Etiosa has a second chance for people to have their say on the kind of representation they want over the next few years. And I'm grateful that the tribunal saw merit in that. And, you know, we have, like you said, we have a second chance. Personally, I think it's a miracle. We've been giving a fighting chance and we're going to take it. And by God's grace, we'll come out successful. 
Well, that's certainly a good uh, opening salvo that you've released there. But it's interesting, though, that, that after the announcement of the results of that election held on the 25th of February this year, which saw, as I mentioned, Einek declaring Tadeus Atta of the Labour Party the winner, you reportedly accepted the results that Einek declared and was quoted as saying that you feel very grateful even in defeat because of the things that you and your team were able to accomplish. So you accepted defeat. I mean, what made you change your mind and head for the trial? Tribunal. Well, you know, I think right after the um, elections were over, I, I felt like the appropriate thing to do was to come to a place of peace um, about what had happened and to just accept that, you know, this is what a democracy is all about. And, and if the elections are free and fair, and if that is indeed the voice of the people, then we accept that. But it was on looking at uh, the analysis and seeing how many places there was evidence that elections just didn't hold and people were prevented from participating in our elections. I think that's not something that we should just um, skirt over. That's not something that we should just let go. And also because there were thousands upon thousands of people that truly believed in the values and the vision that we have for representation in ATIOS and people who gave us their support people who gave us their time, people who volunteered and donated and really, you know, kind of carried our vision with us and stood with us. And for those people, it felt like it wasn't right to just, you know, turn our backs on the process and, and, and let it go. Because leadership, one thing that I've learned is that leadership requires resilience and it requires the courage to stand up for what you believe is right, even if you have to stand alone. And thankfully, we weren't standing alone. There are thousands and thousands of people in Etiosa who felt like they stood with us and we should see this thing to its, its complete conclusion. And at that point, we can make adjustments you know, as need be. But it was the right thing to say. Listen, if we say we're coming in because we want to reform leadership and we want to do gov governance differently and we want things to be done the right way, then this is part of that process. It's part of the process to say, were these elections conducted properly? And if they were not, then are there any things that we can do to ensure that that is the case going forward? And I think this is part of that. So, so that's what we're doing. Well, that's certainly fair enough. Um, so what will your rhythm be this time? What are you going to campaign on? And, and will it be different or similar to the last time? Well, you know, I, technically campaign uh, season hasn't started yet, so I, I'm not here to campaign. But I think for me, it's very clear um, who I am not and who I am. And it's just about putting that forward to the people and letting Etiosa decide for themselves. And whatever they decide is fine. I am pretty confident the analysis shows that there are quite, um, we have a very big advantage in the places where the, um, where the elections didn't hold. So coming out of the gate, we feel very confident and very optimistic that the people will choose us. But I know the kind of, of, of person that I am. I'm somebody that believes in servant leadership. I'm somebody that believes in accountability and transparency. I'm somebody that believes in stewardship. You know, when you are given that responsibility, how do you steward the resources that come through that responsibility? How do you genuinely serve the people? And these are things that I've stood for you know, my entire life, these are things that I've stood for. These are things that my parents instilled in me that I've been doing for the last few years. I also know that I'm not the kind of representative that would win an election and disappear and show up in tweets on social media from time to time. And I'm not the kind of uh, representative who has a bit of an entitlement mentality about the office. If and when I succeed by the grace of God, it will be because of the grace of God and because the people of Etios have decided to entrust me with that responsibility to represent them. And so I, I hold that responsibility with the utmost regard. That is an honor. That is a privilege. Nobody is entitled to that. That's something you, you earn. And you earn the right to serve. You earn the right to lead. And I'm looking forward to that opportunity if uh, and when, by the grace of God, the people of Etios bestow it upon me. So we'll see how it goes, but I'm, I'm very optimistic. Mm. Well, you certainly sound optimistic. You are, of course, uh, known yes, more... Yes, sir. <laughs> 
You are, of course, known more for music and entrepreneurship than politics. I mean, you're famous for your songs. Why the switch to politics? Music not giving you much of a buzz anymore? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. Well, you know, I think depending on what point in my career and my business ventures you meet me, you may know me for certain things. So at certain points, I was known as an artist. At other points, I was known as a record label executive. And there are a lot of people in the music business who are doing way more amazing things than I could ever imagine got their starts from me being that stepping stone and that kind of bridge builder for them to go on and accomplish great things. And the same thing has happened in the film business. Um, quite a few of the most successful films in Nollywood history, um, I've been a part of the group that put them together. I've been a co-executive producer on multiple successful film and TV projects, the most recent being Gangs of Lagos, that my wife co-stars in, by the way. Shout out to Adesua Etomi Wellington. But also, from music to film, um, I co-own a chain of restaurants, one of the fastest growing restaurant chains in Lagos State, um, to real estate, to media and marketing. Um, EME, that used to be a record label, is now a media and marketing agency. And all along, to the glory of God, we've experienced success, but much more than making a bit of money for yourself. We've also served as door openers. We've served as people who have been stepping stones for younger people to come in and do great things. Um, I like to tell the story of a young man who I hired as a bistro chef in Suya Bistro. Today, he's our senior operations manager overseeing eight restaurant locations across the state of Lagos. And when he came in, he was earning minimum wage. But in a few short years, we've seen him grow and establish himself and build capacity and train and become somebody that you can entrust with that responsibility. But like I said, it's not enough for me to experience success for myself or for me to kind of pave the way for just a handful of people. This has to be done for a generation. This has to be done for a nation. This has to be done for the millions of talented young people. Whenever you hear somebody from out of the country interface with Nigerians, one of the things that they always say is that the greatest thing about Nigeria is Nigerians. It's the people. It's our talent. It's our charisma. It's our culture. It's our swag, if people still use that word. We come with so much capacity and competence and character. The problem is that we are not creating opportunities for our young people to go out there and make something of themselves. Young people don't want to live off of handouts. Young people want a chance to fend for themselves and to build a future for themselves. And we need people who are going into government with that mindset. I think, you know, the, the days when we expect people to just be career politicians, I don't know if that's the way to go for us as a nation. I think it's very important that people who have been entrepreneurs, people who have created jobs, people who have provided opportunities, people who have shown a track record of success and service, those are the kinds of people that we want to see um, entering government. And, you know, if you look at my track record as an entrepreneur, as a small business owner, um, and as a servant and a son of my community and my country, um, whether it's from the community service work that I've done, whether it's serving in church as an associate pastor in the Waterbrook Church, whether it's a, a whole host of things that I won't bore you with all the details right now, but I think you will see a track record of service, of servant leadership, of success, and of stewardship. And by the grace of God, I think that that's what we are looking for, and that's what we're missing in a lot of elected offices around the country. And that's what we bring to the table. But it ultimately, it's up to the people of ATSA to decide. And um, by God's grace, I'm, I'm pretty confident and optimistic that it will go in our favor. Well, you certainly sound like as you venture into politics that you've already actually matured in, in that field. I mean, compared to obviously what many people would have seen as, as a, a fascinating and gilded life that you would have led as an entertainer and an entrepreneur and so on. But now that we've got you on air, Banky W, I mean, I wonder if we might get your insight into the darker aspects of Nigeria's music industry and specifically the recent death of the rapper mm. and singer Mo Bad um, under controversial circumstances. I mean, he was signed to the label of the rapper Naira mm. Mali, but when he decided to leave mm. the label, reports suggest he was continuously 
assaulted physically and violently, and many believe he was killed. I mean, what do you think of that? Uh, and how, how can artists leave their labels without these kinds of issues? I mean, his death has become a hot topic on social media and across Nigeria and, and the world, really. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, first of all, I have to say that it is a really tragic story. And as we see more and more of the, the um, behind the scenes unfolding, it's really heartbreaking what has happened to that young man. Um, I didn't know him personally, uh, but I just I kind of got more familiar in the last week or so when all the news was coming out. And it really is a tragic, um, heartbreaking story what has happened to him. And so obviously to his um, uh, family and his friends and his associates, you know, our thoughts and prayers go out to them. I think, you know, I think we, we're at an interesting time in the entertainment business because the eyes of the world are clearly on our music and our film and, you know, just even other things like our fashion and our food. And I think for young people, that's a fantastic thing. But at the same time, I think we need to put measures in place to ensure that there's a level of protection that young, talented people can expect from their country and from their nation when they are facing difficult situations. Where do they go? Who do they turn to? So I think there's, you know, I, I know that uh, 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 an in-depth police investigation has been ordered. And so I'm waiting to see what the results of that investigation are, and then we will know what the next steps to take are. But it truly, truly is a heartbreaking incident, one that we hope will never repeat itself um, again. And, you know, we'll be doing whatever we can to hold the police accountable to the results of that investigation. So, you know, we'll see. Well, I mean, beyond obviously this specific instance, I mean, you're someone who has been in the music industry. I mean, you've talked about running a record label, yeah. being a producer, all the rest of it. So you must know what a lot of us don't yeah. know. I mean, you don't really need a police investigation to tell you that based on your experience. I mean, what does this tell us about the state of the music industry in this country? Because some have suggested that it's been taken over by criminals and cultists. Well, I understand that in the, in the middle of a very um, difficult moment with a case that deserves every amount of attention that we can give it and all the due diligence in the world, I think there will be a tendency to try and cast aspersions on the entire business as a whole. But with all due respect, I think that that might be a mistake. Because I think, you know, in the same vein as, yes, there, there is a lot of darkness that we need to shine the light on and, and make improvements on. The, the entertainment industry, the music field, the, the movie field has done wonders for the image of Nigeria. It has done wonders for the ego and the self-esteem of our young people. It has done wonders to create opportunities for young people. Nollywood, aside from, I think, the federal government and now possibly agriculture, Nollywood is the highest employer of labor in the country. So I, I don't think that taking this position that the entire entertainment business is dark, is dirty, it's filled with criminals, you know, it's corrupt now, I think that that's it's kind of a rash, um, extreme stance to take. I think in the same vein, yes, yes, we look at what needs to be fixed and we make improvements there, but I think we have a lot to celebrate. Our artists are being nominated for Grammys. I really strongly believe that an Oscar is on the way. Hopefully it'll be Gangs of Lagos next year, but I think with the Jadi Oshiberus and Kemi Adetibas and all the amazing, Auntie Mo, Abudu, all the amazing, uh, filmmakers and musicians that we have and what they've done for Nigeria around the world, I think it would be a mistake to assume that the, enter entire, and the entire entertainment industry should be thrown into the gutter. I think, yes, there needs to be a lot that has to be fixed and there needs to be a lot of support and there needs to be a lot of digging into the issues that exist. But I, I don't think that we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think there's a lot to be celebrated even now in the midst of such darkness. Well, I would certainly agree with you there. I don't think anybody was suggesting um, throwing it in the gutter. But let's return to the main topic of our discussion with you, which is Nigerian politics. Yes, I, mean, I, I mean, I expect that after what you've been through, 
in your um, Etiosa constituency election in particular and the broader election across Nigeria in general in 2023 as a PDP member yourself. I mean, there would have been a serious mm -hmm. discussion amongst you and your supporters about the legacy of the 2023 general election. Mm -hmm. I mean, how would you assess and reflect mm -hmm. on that legacy from the point of view of your experience? How will you remember that ballot? Well, you know, I think the legacy of the uh, 2023 elections leaves a lot to be desired, to be honest. I think um, these elections um, kind of left a sour taste in the mouths of millions of Nigerians in terms of just the, the, um, the incidents of violence that occurred, the, um, the way that INEC kind of came up short of the standards that they had promised that we should hold them accountable to. Um, but I also think that a democracy is only as good as the people that choose to get involved in it. And that involvement, when you are trying to get involved in a democracy, you have to understand that it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And I think, you know, we, we tend to just kind of think about the elections. But at the end of the day, the elections are an event. Nation building is a lifetime commitment. And so I think we have to take that big picture approach to say, are we taking steps in the right direction at all? And what, are, what further steps can we take to right this ship? I don't think that the solution to a bad democracy is to um, immediately go to a military coup or anything extreme like that. I think the solution to a bad democracy is a better democracy. It's more people who have like minds and right thinking people, more of those kinds of people getting involved in the system. I mean, take INEC, for instance, right? A lot of people were disappointed with the um, the outcome of the elections in terms of the behavior of INEC in transmitting results. And that is a point of frustration for everyone, right? Not just the candidates or anybody from any one political party. But with that being said, you know, what can we do about that? Until we have a system that is willing to police itself, then the office of the citizen has to police the system. So we have to show up at every polling unit in every ward around the country. We talk about INEC being an independent organization. I'll give you a perfect example. In Etiosa, the INEC office is inside the local government area office. The LGA premises is what holds the INEC office. And the LGA is staffed by essentially members of the ruling party. So how independent do we expect INEC to be when even if somebody genuinely has the right frame of mind, but you put them you know, day in, day out, year after year in the middle of members of one party and you expect that, we expect that maybe they will not feel any kind of pressure and influence, I don't think it's right. Um, so I think that we still have a long way to go, but we're moving in the right direction. And I like to use the example of the United States who, you know, even, you know, with all of their successes, we look at their democratic um, process and we see that even there, there's still work to be done, right? But still, they were able to have a female black Vice President uh, um, Kamala Harris, and prior to that, they had a black president, Barack Obama. But if you go back, you know, a few decades, Rosa Parks had to uh, uh, to decide not to move to the back of the bus, and Martin Luther King had to march, and Malcolm X had to protest. And this is the same country where slavery was championed. But look at where we are today, and and they are still not perfect. So I don't think that you know, the, the heartbreak or the disappointment that we may feel at this time should make us throw in the towel. I think this is where we dig our heels in the sand and understand that this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And we may not be where we want to be yet, but we've come some way and there's so much more to do, so much more work to do to get us to where we want to go. And I think the more of us that have that mindset and commit to this nation building journey, then the better off we'll be. I think not all of us will run for office, but some of us will stick our necks out and we'll do that. And those of us who do, we need people who aren't running for office to be in INEC. We need them to be donors to our campaigns. We need them to be volunteers. We need to find ways, right thinking, like-minded people need, find, need to find ways to partner with each other to put Nigeria on the path towards growth and development. And that's what I believe in with all of my heart. That's what I have convictions about. That's why I'm still here. And regardless of what happens, that's what I will always do. I will always be one of the people that is trying to stick his neck out or his or her neck out 
to be a part of the change that we seek in Nigeria. And I, I'm still optimistic that we will get there. It just may not happen as fast as some people would like it to. Well, I have to say, Banky W, listening to you there, you sound really intellectually and politically very mature. And uh, it's been an absolute delight you, uh, having you on the program today. We're going to play out the segment with one of your songs. Uh, that's, of course, uh, the celebrated Nigerian oh, singer, rapper, <laughs> actor, entrepreneur and politician, Olubankale Wellington, popularly known as Banky W. And uh, he was talking to me from our studios in Lagos there.